What is up and welcome to another edition of the Bruin Bible. Will Decker in the house, joined by my co-host, Mr. Jamal Madney. We have a very, very fun one on the horizon for you Bruin fans today. NBA draft was last night. A couple of Bruins, you know, made their dreams come true by going to the NBA. We're going to do an all-time Bruins draft of the top 10 players to ever put on a UCLA Bruins football jersey Madman, we've been talking about this for a while. It's kind of it's finally coming to fruition. What are your thoughts on this upcoming pod? I think it's going to be a really fun one. Oh, this is going to be great fun, Will. You know, and and sort of channeling the the rich history and tradition of UCLA football and UCLA athletics. I think it's a it's going to be a terrific list of folks that have made huge impacts across many many decades. So I'm excited. We're going to do ten picks, five each. Uh, we're not going to do the timer as they do a normal NFL and NBA draft. We're going to try to let this go, you know, as quickly as possible. We've made our lists. And I'm going to let the Madman kind of start us off here. Madman, you have the first pick in the UCLA Bruin Bible draft, the first ever, I may add. Who is your number one pick for UCLA all time? Number one, Will, you got to go with Gary Beban. There's been one Heisman Trophy winner in UCLA history, and that was Gary Beban. So 67 Heisman winner, 67 Maxwell Award winner. He's He was sort of the architect of, of one of the great UCLA Rose Bowl wins ever against number one Michigan State. 24-5-2 uh, and two as a starter. You know, played in the game of the century on the West Coast against SC uh, in that famous battle with OJ. Uh, so, you know, there's one Heisman winner in the history of UCLA football. That is Gary Beban. Hard to ignore. So I'm going to go Beban number one. Beban's a great choice, man. And he was known specifically for being kind of a dual threat quarterback, was a second round pick selected by the Los Angeles Rams at the time. So he kept it LA based. Going to the next level, the lone Heisman winner's got to go number one. So he is off the board. He was in my top three. He was not my number one choice. I can go in a variety of different directions here, Madman, for number two. Yes, sir. And I think a lot of people would say, why not take Troy Aikman? He's not my number one pick. Why not take Kenny Easley, who I think may have the greatest resume total. But when I'm thinking of if I'm building a team and this is a draft, who do I want to take first? I'm going with Jonathan Ogden, man. The best left tackle I've seen not named Joe Thomas in the history of football that I've watched. This guy was a consensus All-American, four-year starter at UCLA back in the late 90s. Um, was a shot put champion at UCLA, too. He won, basically, he was an All-American in two different sports at UCLA. That's a, as brewing as it gets right there, being able to multitask. And when you put it all together, I mean, this is not necessarily for a, you know, a pro career, but just seeing what he was able to achieve at the next level, coming off of a four-year starter at UCLA. I mean, this guy was the first pick in the history of the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, we're going number four overall to, you know, Ozzie Newsom in that regime. That kind of was the first selection that solidified Ozzie Newsom as one of the best GMs we've seen in our time. Four-time first-team All-Pro uh, five times second team, 11 time Pro Bowler. When I think of the offensive line, he's up there for me, just from my timeline of being a football fan. So, Jonathan Ogden, you know, you got to start your team with a left tackle. Ogden is my guy. That is pick number two. What do you think about that pick, Matt? Matt, love the pick, Will. And, you know, it's interesting how you and I are sort of interpreting top 10 too, for, you know, is, as you want to build a team or who's done the most. I think that's what's so fun about these lists. Uh, love the pick. You know, what's interesting, uh, Will, is Ogden, over the course of his junior and senior seasons, you know, we're kind of, you know, in the mid-90s, he only gave up two sacks over the course of his yeah. final two seasons at UCLA. So, uh, you know, he's UCLA Hall of Fame, College Football Hall of Fame, can't go wrong with Mr. Jonathan Ogden. I think it's a fabulous pick. Unanimous All-American, too, and all was said and done. So, Ogden, when I think of UCLA football, that's the most successful guy from my timeline that I can remember. You get the third pick, man. You can either build the team or you can just pick greatness. I'm trying to like, you know, if I'm You're a draft GM. Yeah. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with some greatness, Will, you know, because I think that sometimes, um, you know, we're, we're in, a, in a society where there's a lot of recency bias. And sometimes you got to kind of give the ode to the OGs every once in a while, you know. Love it. And for me, uh, Will, with the third pick, 
I'm going to go with Kenny Washington. Uh, wow. UCLA's first great football player. Uh, you know, folks don't realize this. UCLA's first ever All-American in 1939. He was to football what Jackie Robinson was to baseball, broke the color barrier, first yeah. African-American to be in the NFL. And what's interesting, Will, is that, you know, UCLA football only started in the Pac-10 and Pac-8 back then in the late 1920s. And they played SC twice in 29 and 30. And then they had to pause the rivalry for five years for UCLA to build up a good enough team to be competitive with SC because SC had like a 25, 30 year head start. And SC in the 20s and 30s had won four national championships under Howard Jones. And it was Kenny Washington in that single wing position that stopped that dominance and set UCLA football on a trajectory of independence and being a great program in the 40s and 50s and, and onwards. And so we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude, not just as NFL fans, but as UCLA football fans, to the first great player in the history of UCLA football, and that was Kenny Washington. And so for all of those reasons, he's my number two and, and number three overall. Just an icon for the sport, too. You know, he broke the color barrier. We could have gone with Jackie Robinson for this purpose as well. He was a UCLA football player as well. So Kenny Washington, if his family are, you know, somewhat listeners of the Bruin Bible, we thank you for what, you know, your grandfather did for the sport, man. Beautiful thing Kenny Washington did. The guy that I got for my fourth pick also has the name Kenny, and that's yep. Kenny Easley, man. Think about this. He was there from 1977 to 1980. This guy played in Norfolk, Virginia, his high school football. How he got to UCLA, I have no idea how. But the second this guy stepped on campus, you were going, this guy is an absolute baller. He had six picks in his freshman year alone as a safety at UCLA. 77 to 80, he's a three-time consensus All-American. Just think about how impressive that is. You know, you get four years of college football if you're lucky as a starter. He got three All-American appearances in that time frame. He went on, you know, to have an illustrious career at UCLA. His 19 interceptions are still the program leader for 41 years. He hasn't played since 1981. The next closest guy is Carlton Gray at 16. And if anyone knows anything about interceptions, they're very hard to get. So three, three is a lot of interceptions away from the next closest guy. So Kenny Easley is our guy. Obviously, he went on to big things in the NFL. You know, he was a top five pick for the Seahawks, made a number of all pro teams, was the 1984 NFL Defensive Player of the Year. And I just want to throw this out there. Seahawks, they have a case that they may have two of the most underrated players in the history of football on offense and defense. Steve Large, and go look at those receiving numbers he put up in Seattle over those years. And then Kenny Easley was one of the best defensive players of the 80s. You know, he was – he beat out the likes of like Lawrence Taylor and some of these other players for that NFL Defensive Player of the Year in 84. So Steve Largent, you know, Kenny Easley, both super underrated, definitely not underrated to Bruins fans. Kenny Easley, the fourth pick in this draft. I like where I'm headed, man. I got my safety and I got my left tackle. Both are going to be studs at the next level. Easley, Will, is, you know, obviously I think pound for pound the greatest player potentially in UCLA football history. You know, you mentioned the 19 interceptions. 324 tackles over the course of his UCLA career, which is a staggering number for somebody in the secondary. You mentioned the three-time consensus All-American, the first UCLA player to do that. He was also the first player to ever be all-conference first team all four years while he was there. So he was all pack what the equivalent of all-pack 12 would be today, first team. Uh, you know, Kenny was there all four years. And then fun fact, Will. Uh, as an NBA guy that you are, I am as well. He was drafted by the Bulls in the early 80s and never actually played in the NBA. So it just speaks to uh, the variety of athlete that he is in, a, in such a significant way. So Kenny Easley was my, you know, right after Beban in terms of greatness and, and Kenny Washington. So love the pick. Man, did not know the NBA factoid. It would have been funny to see him potentially playing with my goat, Michael Jordan, out of the basket. Yeah, your America. goat and, and every sane person in America's goat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, we, great minds think alike, Mad Man. I love it. I love it. Uh, Kenny Easley off the board at number four. I'm going to give you the baton, dude. Number five. Who is the madman? Hey, man, you're making a phone call. You're the GM 
calling this family, letting them know that they're an all-time Bruin. Who are you going with? All-time Bruin, Will, for me at number five, you know, again, you know, thinking about it slightly differently is Kate McNown. And yeah. you know, uh, McNown is obviously all-time passing leader in UCLA history after being a four-year starter, over 10,000 yards, 10,708. He was obviously the the Johnny Unitas Award winner in 98, Pac-10 Co-Offensive Player of the Year in 98, Consensus All-American. But he also was sort of the ar- author and architect for UCLA's greatest winning streak and really their last great period of dominance. You know, the 20-game win streak that extended between the last 10 games of the 97 season and the first 10 games of the 98 season was really – the pinnacle of UCLA football the last quarter century. And, you know, he was able to win the Cotton Bowl in 97. You know, fun fact, in 97, he went up against the number one and number two picks in that draft that year. You know, the UCLA opened against Tennessee and one day. He played Peyton and Ryan Leaf, lost both games by a hair, by a field goal, and then UCLA ripped 10 in a row, won the Cotton Bowl. He was Cotton Bowl MVP and then took all that momentum to win the first 10 games of 98, number two in the rankings, number three overall in the BCS. All they had to do was win that game, the rescheduled game against Miami, which ended up being a shootout with sort of the Edger and James Miami team. And that heartbreak, unfortunately, sent us to the Rose Bowl against Wisconsin and Ron Dane. So it was just an incredible career that Cade McNown has had. And when you talk about achievements, uh, in the powder blue and gold, I have to go with McNown there. It's a fair pick. He was number four on my board. Uh, I had a couple, you know, adjustments with Kenny Easley being available at the number four pick. But I see it, man. This guy had, you know, his last two years at UCLA are the two greatest quarterbacking seasons I think we've seen at UCLA. 49 touchdowns to 17 interceptions there. You mentioned he's the all-time passing leader. And the thing that we've been craving as UCLA fans is we want to get back to those New Year's Bowl bowl games, right? And this guy got us to the Cotton Bowl, like you mentioned, 97, 98, went to the Rose Bowl. That should be the goal for year in and year out for a place like UCLA football. And we're slowly getting back there. McNown got drafted 12th to the Chicago Bears back in 1998. Didn't really work out, but, you know, I think Cade McNown, maybe in another system with another coaching staff, could have made that NFL dream work. Kate McNown is a very, very worthy number five pick. I'm stoked you took him off the board, Mad Man. Uh, this leads us into number six, and this is my third pick. This is a tough one. I could go in a variety of different directions on this one. But you know what? I'm going to go for the quarterback that had the better career than Kate. And this could be shocking to some. I think he's underrated at this point in time. That's Brett Hundley. If you look at the stats with Brett Hundley and what he was able to achieve as the UCLA quarterback, it's almost underrated. It's kind of swept under the rug because his NFL career didn't pan out as, as you know, people thought it should. When he was a freshman and they won nine games, I looked at my dad and I said, this guy's going to be the number one pick in the draft. When all works out, Hundley was that electric as a quarterback. And the stats back that up. Three years on campus at UCLA, 29 wins. What's the record for UCLA? 10 wins. He matched Cade McNown, the two 10-win seasons, his last two years on campus. You got to beat USC to be a UCLA legend, right? He beat him two out of the three times he played, including the first two tries that he did it. Touchdown to interception ratio. Cade McNown, great final two years there. No one's disputing that. He reached heights that I don't think we've ever seen at the quarterback position at UCLA. 49 touchdowns, 17 picks. His career stats, Madman, is 68 touchdowns to 41 interceptions. Did not really have a great freshman and sophomore year if you go back to the UCLA stats. Remember? On these career stats, 75 touchdowns to 25 picks through the air. That is a 3-1 to one touchdown to interception ratio. Oh, by the way, he had 31 touchdowns on the ground over those three years. That's an average of over 10 a year rushing the football. That's good enough for eighth in the history of UCLA in this long line of great running backs we've had. Call me crazy, but Brett Hundley, I think if you redo his career nine or ten times, this is a Bill Simmons thing that I'm incorporating into this podcast. <laughs> if you redo Brett Hundley's career, I think there's a scenario where this guy is lighting it up in an NFL offense. Maybe I still haven't given up on this. Maybe I still haven't given up on Rosen at this point. But Hundley, to me, he was the guy that brought back UCLA football to a point where we thought 
you know, Jim Mora was going to lead them for the next decade plus. Am I crazy in this assessment? No, Will. Uh, you know, I think I love the points that you brought up. And, you know, I, I was me and my dad were there at that Pac-12 championship game in 2012 against Stanford, you know, watching that field goal go wide left at, you know, with time wow. expiring. I mean, I, I still my dad still wakes up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night on a random Wednesday thinking about that game, Will. So I'm all there with you 100 percent. I think everything you mentioned, right, the 29 wins over three seasons, and and well, he wasn't two out of three against SC. He was three and zero against SC, and and okay. so there was a tremendous amount of of success there. Here's why I have him a little bit lower than some of the other quarterbacks because I think you have to take contextual dominance into account. You know, the modern NFL and the modern college game is much more quarterback friendly than it was in the 90s and the 80s and so forth. It's sort of a similar argument in the NBA, right, where, you know, triple doubles become a little bit more inflated now with the, the, the presence of the three-point shot. You know, so you have to sort of compare eras for eras. And that's where I sometimes get a little bit nervous when we just sort of count things without that contextual dominance. For me, the only – and I'm a huge Hunley guy. He's one of the all-time great UCLA players – for me, the only reason he's not quite in that sort of McNown Beban level is the ceiling. You know, he was 3 and 0 against SC, but he was 0 and 4 against Stanford. 0 and 4 and 0 and 2 against Oregon. You know, we just couldn't quite convert those Sun Bowls and the Alamo Bowls into sort of the big big prizes at the very end. But Hunley to me has been spectacular and I completely agree with you. You know, when you see some of the guys that are getting looks in the NFL today, you know, Brett Hundley had it all. The greatest athlete to ever play quarterback at UCLA. I totally agree with that. And, and the architect of bringing UCLA back um, after, you know, a, a decade of, of dormancy. So I love the pick. And what I would push back on, too, is if they are throwing the ball more, he only had 25 interceptions in three years to 75 touchdowns. You know what I mean? So yeah. the, in the turnovers, I mean, that's just impressive. If we're throwing the ball more, he's still turning it over less than yeah. a McDown over a four-year span. So he didn't quite get the heart there, Will. So, you know, you have to sort of compare that, right? Like, he's gotten more stats in one era than another guy has in another era, but he didn't win any of the hardware, which means that the guys he was playing with had even more stats than he did, right? So you, you sometimes have to take those things into consideration. Well, I guess we'll have to agree to disagree, man. Yeah, I love them both, but I think Hunley, like you said, is the most talented quarterback. Yeah. And I think if you redo his career – like nine, nine out of ten times, I think he's maybe winning a Heisman. Maybe he's doing something. And I'd love – I mean, if we could take one UCLA player and put him in this Chip Kelly era, oh, my oh, God. Hundley totally. might be number one on that list. So I'm a massive, massive Hundley guy. Can't go wrong with McNown either. Seventh pick, Madman. Who do you got and why? So for me, seventh pick, just kind of in terms of the greatness piece, right, and, and kind of looking at it that way, I got to go with Aikman. And, okay. you know, obviously two years at UCLA, 87 and 88, he was Davey O'Brien winner in 88, All-American in 88. He was Pac-10 player of the year in 87, 20 and four as a starter, yeah. um, you know, was Cotton Bowl MVP in 87 and had that great, you know, sort of uh, grudge match with Rodney Pete in, in that great quarterback duel in 88. And, you know, Pete with sort of the measles was able to sort of win that game. You know, if, if Aikman wins that game, it was number two versus number three. You're talking about potentially UCLA winning the national championship that year. So he really, I think, was the culmination in many ways of the Terry Donahue era. You know, Donahue was able to win three Rose Bowls in the 80s, but with sort of some journeyman type quarterbacks. And to be able to get Aikman to transfer from Oklahoma and those great sort of Barry Switzer teams, obviously they were running – uh, wishbone there in Oklahoma won the title in 85 with Boz and all those guys. And he wanted sort of pro style West coast offense comes to UCLA. It was a match made in heaven and he's still so iconic. And so again, for the hardware, for the wins 20 and four over two years, again, averaging, you know, what's, what's been the common denominator here, Will, that we've talked with over the last few quarterbacks, McNown back-to-back -back 10 wins, Hundley back-to-back -back 10 wins, now Aikman back-to-back -back 10 wins. So when we talk about that being the expectation moving forward for UCLA, look, the blueprint has been there, and Troy was, was really kind of one of the last great quarterbacks at UCLA. 
Yeah, 41 touchdowns and 17 interceptions those two years for Aikman. He was on my board. You know, in two years, he achieved a lot for UCLA. Number one overall pick in the NFL draft, Troy Aikman was. So, I mean, this is a guy, a legend. When you think of UCLA football, this is normally the guy you think of in the modern day. It's Troy Aikman. Eighth pick. Madman, this is where it gets really, really tough for me. And yeah. I'm, I'm down to two guys. And I'm thinking of a guy that had – Two seasons that were incredibly, incredibly high or the all-time leading tackler at UCLA. And it's, it's either or. And they overlapped. But I think for how high this ceiling was, and we only got two years of Anthony Barr at UCLA, his peak was something special. And just to put this in perspective, Anthony Barr, two seasons, he played 26 total games for UCLA, 41 and a half tackles for a loss, and 23 and a half sacks. Like, what more do you want from Anthony Barr? This guy was a finalist, you know, for the Butkus Award, things like that. His two, 2013 season could go down as the best a defensive player has had in a pass rushing situation for UCLA. 2013, 13 and a half sacks led the Pac 12, 21 and a half tackles for a loss led the Pac 12, and he forced six fumbles, which was the all time, or which was the leading you know, stat for the NCAA. Like he, he caused the most forced fumbles in the NCAA that year. Anthony Barr has, you know, continued to do his thing in Minnesota, has had a nice NFL career. But I think Bruins fans, when you look back at the stats, my whole thing is if you are averaging more tackles for a loss than games played, you're doing yeah. something right. It's like right. a 300 hitter or a three-point shooter that shoots 40%. When you have 41 and a half tackles in 26 games, almost – a tackle and a half for loss per game. You are doing something stupid. Like you are crushing it against opponents. Anthony Barr is my guy at number, you know, number eight. I don't, I don't know what to think of it, but Madman, tell me your thoughts because I'm a huge bar guy. Love it. I mean, it's, it's a great pick. He was, he's on my list, Will. So I was probably going to take him next if you hadn't. So I, I completely agree. You know, all American in in 2013. He was the Lot Trophy winner in 2013 yeah. as well, which was it's about defensive player impact both on the field as well as off the field. You mentioned the 23 and a half sacks, 152 tackles, over 100 of them are the solo variety. You talk about the tackles for loss, and really just the the athlete that you think of at the defensive position. You have to think Anthony Barr, and I think. There's also sort of a cultural phenomena piece here too, Will, in terms of his impact on UCLA. He may have had the greatest hit of any UCLA oh, yeah. player of the 21st century. You know, the, the 2012 kind of blindside sack on Matt Barkley in that Brilliant. 2012 game to clinch that game. He knocked Barkley out of the game there, and that ultimately was the changing of the guard, right? That was Hunley's first year. That was, you know, more of sort of announcing to the, the Pac-12 that UCLA now is going to turn the tide. Everyone forgets that in that 2011 game, UCLA lost 50 to nothing. It was a string of 12 out of 13 through the Carroll years. That hit symbolized a new era and a reshifting of the balance of power in Los Angeles football. So obviously all the statistical things, but also from an emotional element, Anthony Barr, an all-time great hardware, the emotions, the stats, it's all there. I love it, man. And Anthony Barr, he was just too tantalizing on my draft board. I feel like draft day of the movie when uh, Kevin Costner is going up and trying to get his guys, man. So Anthony Barr, my pick at number eight. Going to paddle it back over to my guy, Madman. Number nine, who do you got, brother? So there's a couple here, Will. And, you know, I'm sure you'll get your 10. And then, you know, I want to have some sort of honorable mentions as well just to sort of give bunch. some hope to folks. But – you know, I think another underrated player, I know I, I'm going to let you go with number 10. I know sort of you're salivating at the idea of Kendricks, but I'm going to go at nine. I'm going to go Chris Ferris. And in 98, another, the other great lineman in the history of UCLA football in the modern era, along with Jonathan Ogden, everyone forgets. Chris Ferris also won the Outland Trophy in 1998. Ogden won the Outland Trophy in 95. He was sort of the protection for Kate McNown for that 20-game winning streak. You know, gave up only 
five sacks over the course of his UCLA career, an absolutely dominant lineman. So for those reasons, Chris Ferris uh, really deserves a spot here on the top 10. Chris Ferris, he was, you know, the defensive side of the football when it came to those, you know, Cade McNown teams as well, man. So just a legend in his own right. Madman, there are so many different directions we can go with this. And I want to bring up a couple of the names that we haven't brought up. Uh, let's go with Mercedes Lewis, you know, a yep. Mackey Award winner back in 2005. Still the all-time leader in the tight ends position for catches and yards. And he's second all-time in receiving history with 20 touchdowns for the program. Just behind J.J. Stokes, another guy we could talk about. His 93 season with these 17 touchdowns. I mean, we talked about the tackles for a loss. You have more than like one a game. You're doing something right. 17 yep. touchdowns in 13 games is absurd and deserves to be, you know, a spot in the honorable mention if J.J. Stokes is not there. Um, you know, Eric Kendricks was a guy that I'm thinking of. I'm not taking him with number 10. Okay. He's the all-time leading tackle tackler at UCLA. Won the Buckus Award. Does deserve to be in the conversation. I don't think I can go there. I thought Barr's highs were a little bit higher than Kendrick's for my okay. money. Uh, Randy Cross is another guy that I'm looking at. You know, this guy was a first-team All-American guard. He switched from center, three-year starter at UCLA. And the reason he deserves to be in the honorable mention category is this guy was a part of the biggest win in UCLA history for my money. And it was the 1976 Rose Bowl Number one Ohio State came with Woody Hayes. And for people that didn't know college football back then, this was like beating a Nick Saban or beating an Urban Meyer. Woody Hayes was that dude at that point in the 1970s. He was the guy that every coach wanted to be like, emulate, you name it. That was the guy. And UCLA got it done with Terry Donahue and company in the Rose Bowl 1976. Randy Cross obviously went on and had a great career. But long story short, the last pick in this draft is a guy that I feel like did not get his due. And when I looked at the stats, Madman, it was just too much to ignore. A lot of these may have been goal line situations, but he still had 2,000 yards rushing seasons to Maurice jones Shrews one, and that's Skip Hicks. Skip Hicks, yep. the tailback, his last two years on campus, 39 touchdowns rushing the football. 39 touchdowns in 23 games. Going up, Will. So, you know, you're, you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> 23 games, you know, he rushed for over a thousand yards and back to back in those years, you know, was averaging close to five yards to carry in those situations as well. Skip Hicks is my last pick. Even, you know, had some nice receiving yards in his last year, 300, 400 yards, got drafted the NFL, you know, played for the Titans for a little bit, did his thing. Skip Hicks is my last pick because 48 career touchdowns. Somebody's got to give it to the guy, man. That's incredible stuff for a four year career in college. Uh, what are your thoughts on Skip Hicks, man? Love Skip Hicks. I mean, he was obviously, I'll always remember Skip Hicks in that 96 SUCLA game when he, you know, it was the only game in the history of the rivalry that went into overtime. It was 48 41. Ultimately, UCLA prevailed in triple overtime after being down 17 with less than seven minutes to go. And Hicks was the linchpin to bring UCLA back from the dead. Um, I'll always remember growing up watching split uh, Skip Hicks in the split formation. You know, in those days, you had two backs on each side, and, and Hicks was always great running left to right. And, and that was sort of – it was off that split formation that he got so many touchdowns in the red zone. You know, if you go back and do sort of a film study of his 48 touchdowns, I would say mid-30s touchdowns were all inside the red zone because he had that ability to sort of carve up the sticks – uh, you know, inside uh, in goal line situations, red zone situations. He was my fa one of my favorite Bruins growing up. Uh, absolutely love the pick, Will. And, you know, for me, I'm glad you mentioned Randy Cross. I think John Shara deserves to get a lot of mention. He was the quarterback on that 66 Rose Bowl team that ultimately beat Ohio State 23-10. I agree with you. I think that was the greatest win in school history, followed by the Beaven victory against number one Michigan State. Uh, when when Beaven played them in, you know, they, that was the 76 Rose Bowl. Beaven was the 66 Rose Bowl. Um, and then I think two other names that don't get a lot of mention. One is uh, Jerry Robinson, Will, uh, the only other three-time All-American at UCLA, yeah. along with Kenny Easley from 76 to 78, and really were part of that sort of trilogy of teams in the Pac-10 then when it was kind of the McKay Trojans, the Bruins, and then the Don James Washington Huskies. 
Um, and then the other, you know, name that, you know, we're, we're going way back is Don Mumau. Uh, and he was a two-time All-American from 1950 to 1952. In many ways, Don was sort of what Carson Palmer and Troy Polamalu were to USC. Don was to UCLA really setting the, the, the road and paving the road for that great 1954 UCLA National Championship team with Red Sanders and the way that Palmer and Polamalu kind of paved the road for, for Carroll to win national championships. Don did the same for UCLA in the 50s. So uh, what fun this was. My goodness, we, we went down kind of memory lane, all different eras, but uh, this was a ton of fun, Will. And what great players at UCLA. It's fun to think back too, and even just some recent guys that you know you could have made the case for. I think Sean Ryan, just for the three years he had on campus, there could have been a case there for that. Uh, maybe Quinn Lake. We didn't even mention Carnell Lake, his dad, who was a very solid player. He still has the program record for tackles for a loss. I think if Quinn played more games, like he could have been on this list too, okay. just given the impact he played with. Uh, you know, I'm a Dulcich guy. It's no secret with the Bruin Bible. Maybe a little bit more targets. Dulcich's way he could have been on there. But I think we did a good job of, you know, connecting all the different eras for UCLA and making well, that well, You know, you mentioned also, you know, easily an argument could be made for Jonathan Franklin, UCLA's all-time all leading rusher. Yeah. 4,000 yards over four years. Gaston Green, who was, you know, UCLA's iconic running back uh, in the 80s over the course of some of those Rose Bowl teams. You talk about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the other Kareem Abdul-Jabbar <laughs> Abdul-Jabbar, who was Sharman Shaw in the mid-90s, Paul Perkins, a um, lot, you know, Freddie Mitchell, Danny Farmer, those great 90s teams, you know, on and on we can Kareem go. McNeil, you know, just guys, all those dudes. It's funny that the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar thing cracks me up. No, no, the one that went to UCLA. Uh, what? There's two of them. Yeah. It's no, just the, the most I, Not two E's. You know, it's like... <laughs> Will I before E except that for C? I think UCLA can come up with their own little limerick for the Kareem. It's the Kareem with an I, not with the double E's. You know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the one that went to UCLA. It's It always has cracked me up. This is one of those kind of sports funny moments. We're trying to cook up more things with LAFB coming up uh, this year. So please send in suggestions. Please subscribe to LA Football Network. This is going to be a huge, huge year for UCLA football content and LA football content as a whole. I'm going to have this guy, the madman on weekly to be discussing UCLA stuff. It's going to be so much fun. Get us to football season, fellas. But uh, 2022, uh, we had an awesome freaking draft. Top 10 Bruin Bible of all time. Bruin Bible, we are out.